The Scottish coastal village of Curis, nestled within the western fringes of Fife, is a place where the veil between the past and the present is unusually thin. But its cobbled streets and red tiled cottages are not the only things from Curis's past still to be found within the village today. Beneath the veneer of the quaint, wholesome toy town that time forgot lurks the spectre of Curis's dark, often chilling past. Little surprise then that the village is notorious as one of Scotland's most haunted locations, synonymous with paranormal activity and the occult, as we will investigate over the course of this documentary. Thought to have been founded by St. Surf in the 6th century CE, Curis would initially develop as a centre of early Celtic Christianity. A Cistercian abbey was built upon the site of St. Surf's Pictish Church in 1217, with the shadows of Curis's Christian genesis penetrating throughout the village's history until the modern day. However, the village was transformed in the 16th century by merchant Sir George Bruce, who established Curis as a place of industry and European trade most notably the trade of salt and of coal that he mined from beneath the River Forth. Curis Palace was built by Sir George between 1597 and 1611 as his principal residence. But despite being buried in Curis Abbey in 1625, some question whether he ever truly left the palace. In his work Ghosts of Fife, Richard Faulkner relays the accounts of a palace gardener from 1997 who claims to have witnessed a man dressed in 16th century clothing and a tall hat walking from one part of the palace into another. Confused by what he had seen and sure that there were no historical actors on site that morning, he followed the man into the room, only to discover he had vanished. In October of 2020, one staff member was waiting for a colleague to arrive at the property at noon. Sitting not far from the outer door, she heard footsteps echo up the cobbled street and saw the latch on the door go as if someone was attempting to enter. She immediately got up and opened the door, only to find there was no one there. Several sightings of Sir George have been reported in the palace strong room, historically where Sir George would have stored his documents and his fortune. Visitors, particularly men, often feel uneasy in the strong room above all others and it is not uncommon for them to develop goosebumps or a quickness in breath. In 2017, a palace tour guide entered the room alone to switch on some artificial candles only to discover four large feather quills swirling in their ink pot. Skeptical, she checked for a draft at the window and considered whether she had disturbed them with her coat but the quills continued swirling. It was only when she spoke out loud and reassured that she was simply there to activate the candles and would leave immediately afterwards that the quills instantly fell motionless. On another occasion, a child entered the strong room and was discovered by her mother laughing and talking with someone, despite the room being empty. When asked who it was she was talking to, the girl replied that it was the man with the hairy face and funny white thing around his neck. When brought upstairs to the room where Sir George's portrait hangs, the girl started waving and identified Sir George as the man she had seen. As well as Sir George, the palace is said to be haunted by his wife, Lady Margaret, and their eight children. Another resident phantom is said to be Colonel John Erskine, also known as the Black Colonel. He is reputed to be especially active on the top floor where he once held Masonic meetings and was particularly mischievous when renovations were being made to that part of the palace. Complaints are often made by visitors experiencing jabs in their sides or heavy breathing on their necks whilst in these rooms. Staff and visitors who enter the palace continue to be haunted by the inexplicable sound of disembodied ghostly voices 
of footsteps, of sudden drops in temperature and the smell of red wine in various locations within the palace. In the woods in the east of the village is St Mungo's Chapel. Said by legend to be the stepson of Curus's founder, St Serf, St Mungo was thought to have been born on the site of the chapel and would go on to found the city of Glasgow. On Hogmanay of 1799, Brother Joseph MacGregor, a monk, had a premonition that the chapel would collapse. From that day onward, chapel pews would jolt suddenly and candles would light of their own volition, seemingly the work of demonic forces. Villagers became steadily determined that the chapel had been possessed by the devil and on the summer solstice of 1800 the chapel collapsed with Brother Joseph in sight. One woman who witnessed the devastation recalled, I saw the cloven feet of the devil and his disciples on the chapel roof. They danced and fornicated on the timbers and laughed as the roof fell inwards. I heard the good brother wail during the storm as he denounced the devil's work. To this day, ghostly figures and the wailing of Brother Joseph have been reported around the chapel woods. Venturing into the woods myself, I sought to discover whether there was any unusual activity in a nearby abandoned 17th century hospital. In the north of the village is Curis Abbey. Although ostensibly a picture of serenity, its beauty conceals a darker undercurrent. Memento Mori iconography can be found all around the abbey grounds, particularly on the headstones in the kirkyard. For centuries, these symbols of mortality have purposefully acted as a daily reminder to the villagers of Curis that none can escape the irresistible pursuit of death. Another feature of the abbey is its hooded phantoms with their cold staring eyes. Accounts from throughout the ages recall sightings of ghostly monks from bygone times haunting the abbey they have known so long. On a warm moonlit night, I went to the abbey to see for myself whether the accounts were true.
Kuris townhouse was constructed in 1626, with the clock tower added in 1783. The building functioned as a forum for the town council, as a courthouse and as a prison, including for those in the village accused of practising witchcraft. Justice in early modern Kuris was crude. Villagers could use the tron, a device used for measuring weight, to determine whether the produce they were being sold was in the correct quantity the merchant they purchased it from claimed it was. If it was not, the merchant would be taken to the market cross and would have their ear nailed to it for several days as punishment and would be pelted by passing villagers for the duration. Many merchants simply elected to rip their ear free from the nail, though it would be left with a distinctive disfigurement, giving rise to the phrase, rip off merchant. Villagers could be brought to the townhouse for all sorts of crimes, theft, adultery and even blasphemy, for which they would be branded with an S on their body for sinner. The brutality of the history has led some to question whether the townhouse remains haunted by its gruesome past to this day. Bizarrely, after filming the townhouse after dark one evening, I discovered my camera had recorded an unusual sound it had never done before. In 2020, a photographer who ran a gallery in the townhouse recounted several instances of paranormal activity from his time working in the building. As well as witnessing his artwork fly from the walls and lights suddenly go out of their own accord, he recalled one encounter from a cold winter's day. Whilst working in the gallery, the door handle began to turn, as if someone was attempting to enter. As he walked across the room and went to open the door, the handle continued to turn, but when he pulled the door open, there was no one to be seen. One area of the building where visitors are particularly likely to report feelings of unease is a spot in the so-called witch's prison on the upper floor, where the spirit of a young girl is said to linger. Some visitors have even reported a sensation of being pushed around by spirits in this area. Oddly, in 2020, a child's shoe was discovered on that very spot. Questions remain why the shoe had not been discovered years earlier, particularly given the room had been inspected thoroughly by curators, even in recent times. More curiously, it is thought that the shoe itself was likely originally put there in the 1800s as a method of warding off spirits, as this was a common practice in years gone by, and by extension, it can be concluded that feelings of unease in that spot are no modern phenomenon. The witch's prison itself gains its name from one of the darkest times in the village's history, when innocent villagers accused of witchcraft would be locked there before sentencing. The top floor being ideal, as it was perceived to be further from hell and the corrupting forces of the devil. According to the University of Edinburgh's survey of Scottish witchcraft, 32 villagers, 31 women and one man, were formally charged with practising witchcraft. To give context, 30 people were formally found guilty of the same crime during the witch trials in Salem, Massachusetts. In 1675, Catherine Sands was found guilty of having renounced her baptism, received Satan's mark, and engaged in a sexual satanic ritual with the devil himself. A bizarre local legend from 1684 recalls the tale of Helen Elliot. Imprisoned for practicing black magic and awaiting her inevitable fate, Elliot was suddenly confronted by the devil. Taking her in his arms, he flew Elliot out a nearby window and raised her high into the air. Though as Elliot screamed out, the devil dropped her to the ground, where she was then arrested once more and burnt at the stake soon after. As the village memorial to those accused of witchcraft states, these were indeed the innocent victims of unenlightened times. Kuris is home to some of Fife's most fascinating gravesites, including the plague graves in the outskirts of the village, where the bodies of three victims of the plague of 1645 still lie. West Kirk, the original parish church for Kuris from around 1100 until the Protestant Reformation in 1560, also hosts a spectacular graveyard.
However, if legend is to be believed, the story of one man above all others stands as the most fascinating of all those whose final resting place was West Kirk. The lore of Scotland, a guide to Scottish legends, recalls a local belief that a subterranean labyrinth exists beneath the village. In this labyrinth, a man sits on a golden throne, ready to grant unknown riches to the one who discovers him. Centuries ago, a blind piper and his dog discovered the entrance to a tunnel beneath Cudis Abbey. As he marched in, pipes blaring, the villagers followed the piper above ground as they listened to the sound of his instrument beneath. Mile after mile he went onward, until he reached West Kirk. It was then that the pipes fell silent, and the villagers knew that the demons below had set upon him. That day would be the last that he would ever be seen by another living soul. Thankfully, the piper's dog escaped and returned above ground some time later. On visiting Westkirk, I hoped to discover some clue as to what had happened 